really very jaded comments. And uh, <laughs> thanks for the opposition. Um, Sir David. Ladies and gentlemen, Honourable Chair, uh, it's great to be able to speak to the likes of Jonathan Wilson and people there. The conversation at dinner was appalling if you don't like football. It was great for myself, Sean. And, you know, I don't want to say sorry or wow, you really know a lot more for a girl about football. Um, it's called you almost know as much as Sean Butler did because Sean Butler is the angriest Liverpool fan, and that's some achievement right there. <laughs> He's also the angriest Athlone fan I've ever met, which is another achievement because I haven't met any Athlone fans. <laughs> and he came up and said they will have that, they'll never, nobody in Ireland will ever have that memory of playing AC Milan in Athlone. Which is true, because very few people will play AC Milan in Athlone. But if you're a Shamrock Rovers fan, and he actually said this, you can remember Juventus showing up to Tala. Irish people won't go to Tala, but Juventus <laughs> had to. You will have the memory of holding Juventus to one little draw in possibly the wettest pitch in Italy. That's what you have. And I don't care what Sean says about how it's mediocrity. Fulham did make it to last year's UEFA, uh, uh, whatever it's called, final. Um, they did make it to the final. That's not mediocrity. They may not have, they may, yes, they may survive the 13th place in the Premier League. And Athlone Town may hope for survival in the First Division. And Galway United <coughs> may hope for survival in the Premier League. But in the back of their heads, Fulham will think, you know, one day maybe we could win the Premier League. Athlone may think one day we could get into the Premier Division. And Galway have to think one day we can get into Europe. And beyond that, maybe we can challenge for the title. Because what is the point of entering the competition if at some point you don't think you're going to win it? That's when football says so is when clubs go, do you know what, we can't be arsed to win games. When they throw games, when they decide they're not going to go out and give it all for the fans. And that brings it back to a very simple question. At the level that we, vast majority of in here, I can't see everybody's face, so I don't know if there are people who played at a very high level. If there are, congratulations, well done, you're much better than me. But that brings it back to a fundamental level. Where can someone please tell me, in the football pyramid, and I'll use the English example because it's the best example of a pyramid, where exactly in that pyramid does it change from being a game about the people playing it to a game about the people watching it? That's what I want to know. That has never been explained to me and it's something I find very hard. Because I regard the beautiful game as all football. I do regard it as 11 million, I do regard it as 11 millionaires against 1100 millionaires from 15 different countries in the new Camp as the beautiful game. Especially if Barcelona are playing, especially if Spain are playing, because that's beautiful football. But likewise, the best player I ever saw in this country was a 15 year old girl in drum. That was the beautiful game. And that had nothing to do with, with people watching it. That had nothing to do with money. That had to do with the joy of having a ball at her feet and being exceptional at what she does. Her name's Julianne Russell. She's a current Irish international. She is amazing. Go see her if you get a chance. Because fundamentally, if football has lost its soul, we need to pinpoint when did this happen? And we can say 1992 with the birth of the Premiership. We can say when the first club played one million pounds for the Church of France in 1979, Nottingham Forest. I'd go back even further. Football, if you say football sold its soul, or lost its soul, you have to say that happened on the very first day anybody was charged an admittance fee to watch a match. Because at that point, the fundamental nature of the game changed. It no longer came about, it was no longer a game about people on a pitch kicking a football into a net. It came, up, it came about a product presented to people so they could come and watch, to come and support. And fundamentally, if you look at the reasons why, the very argument Sean is making, he's saying it's taking away from the fans. The reason that clubs suffer in the championship as compared to the premiership, irrespective of parachute payments, is because their attendances go down. People want to see successful teams. They want to see success. If anybody sold its soul, it's the fans. Because they're no longer prepared to just support their local team. How many of us here are fans of teams we do and are not within a 10 mile radius of where we were born? How many of us here are not supporters of fans who are, of teams who are not in this country? We have to accept we don't support our local teams. And if we don't support our local teams, it's not the clubs who are to blame. Yes, they try to get in the best players. Yes, they have to pay them the biggest wages. Why? So that people will come and watch their games. 
It's a fundamental characteristic. The fans have let the players down as much as the players let the fans down. It's all one game. No one particular sector is any more culpable or less culpable than the others. Boards directors make mistakes, they get thrown out. Footballers make mistakes, they get thrown out. Managers make mistakes, they get thrown out. Fans don't show up to watch the team and support them. You can't throw them in, and you can't throw them out. That's why it is. It is one big dynamic. The beautiful game is, mo if, you accept that it's, if you accept that it has a soul, you have to accept that it's not just the players, it's not just the boards, it's not just the fans, and everybody is culpable. Do we, I'm definitely saying, do we have to go back to our roots? Well, what are the roots of football? Professional football exists because people had to be paid to play. Because the only people who can afford, who can, who can play amateur football at a high level are people who can afford to play football at a high, at a high level and at an amateur and not get paid for it. You simply cannot have a system where you increase a cap, introduce a cap on wages. Because we've had that in the past. In the 20s and 30s, players had a cap of four pounds. Then it became eight pounds. And up until it was removed in 1961, it was only 20 pounds. But you cannot, you cannot believe that if you introduce a cap, that everybody's going to abide to it. In the 20s and 30s, Arsenal had a player called Alex James. And he owned eight quid a week. But he was only, more, he was only 12 quid a week as an official Arsenal demonstrator at Selfridges. There are ways around it. Look at GAA. Are you seriously telling me that every single player and every single manager in GAA is an amateur? Is not receiving something? Be it mild, be it a good job, be it as it was in the 1860s, fish or meat or an extra day off work, something in lieu. That's what happens. That's why you need to shamaturism. And if you continue with shamaturism, you end up in a situation and say you must have a cap. We again look back to our roots of football, professional football. And you have a situation where the football league exists because if it didn't, you'd have two games of football. You'd have professional Northern football in England and amateur Southern amateur football in the South. And where does that happen? That was called rugby. I think a sport that sells its soul, but it can't keep half its teams on the, half its teams walk away and decide to set up their own sport. Then you've got a problem. Not when you're playing people, not when you're trying to make it a business. That's the fundamental issue. Football hasn't sold its soul. So and so and so, because A, we haven't proved that it has its own, and secondly, we've proven that everybody's to blame. But then we come back to the idea, well, we'll look, show about the point about what about what's happening on the pitch, as if somehow what's happening on the pitch is a problem, is a bad, it's, it's, it's terrible, it's gone so wrong. The one advantage most of you have, you know, I'm going to throw it in, a lot of you were born in the late 80s and the early 90s. You are blessed you didn't see football in the late 70s and the early 80s, because for every Liverpool, there was a Watford. For every Manchester United, there was a Wimbledon. Football in the 80s was as characterized by the long ball game and was as boring and as terrible as it ever has been. The 1990 World Cup, ironically enough, praised to the hills in today's Guardian as one of the best World Cups that we uh, 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 the rest of it. No, it wasn't. It was terrible. It was a shocking World Cup. Two players getting sent off in the final World Cup is not a good World Cup final make. But then we said, but then, we, then we have this round of Nigel de Jong. Now, I'm not justifying any type of Nigel de Jong is made, but to suggest that Nigel de Jong is all that's wrong with football, and nothing like that has ever happened in the past, is completely wrong. The Battle of Bern in 1954, between Hong Kongry, the greatest team in Europe, Brazil, the greatest team in South America, was a riot. The Battle of Santiago in 1962, which if you've ever seen it on YouTube, it goes the greatest ever Kung Fu kick to a head in the middle of your World Cup qualifier you'll ever see. I'm not saying anything about those two games, apart from the fact they were both refereed by Englishmen. <laughs> <laughs> the Battle of Bordeaux in 1938, Brazil again. The first World Cup, it's the Battle of Bordeaux, three men, three were sent off in 1938. And of course, the Football War. A World Cup qualifier ends in a draw between El Salvador and Honduras. Neither side likes it, so they go to war. Worse things happen than Nigel de Jong trying to decapitate, trying to cut uh, Xavi Alonso's knee off the chest. <laughs> worse things happen. That's not to justify what happens, but to suggest this football is somehow now worse than it's ever been, I think it's far too cynical. Yes, it is not good that fans, when they see themselves on big screens, wave at the camera. But that doesn't mean to say that, 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 that that's terrible, that we're so much salt. It just means that those particular fans are gorgeous. <laughs> and it's not just a football game. You go to a GA match. Okay, yeah, GA fans are a bit gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> We did, John thought about the fact that it's terrible that Manchester City's average age of its 
of the season ticket holder has stayed the same for the last 10 years. That is bad. That is not good. But that doesn't mean to say that football has sold its soul. It could just mean, A, that the kids don't like Manchester City. B, they're fat, lazy, and they want to play PlayStation. Or C, Manchester City on its own has sold its soul. There's also D, which is the of Man United games. But as we all know, nobody in Manchester <laughs> ever goes for Man United game. And then we come, but I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think the football is so so if you use that example, because one of the greatest images of the first weekend of this season was that little kid at Wigan. He couldn't have been any more than seven or eight. And Blackpool just won their first game in the Premiership 4 0. And that kid didn't give a toss about how much the players were getting paid. That kid didn't give a toss about how many people, what the average age of the Blackpool, the Blackpool season ticket holder. That little kid had just seen his team win their first ever match in the biggest league in the world, as far as he was concerned, 4 0 away from home. And as long as little kids can go and enjoy that experience, as long as little kids can still believe. But there's a chance they could end up playing for Blackpool. As long as 11 lads playing another 11 lads in Soweto with the, and with the dream that one day they could all play in the new camp. As long as the Athlone towns of this world had the memories of playing AC Milan. Juventus are playing. Sorry, Juventus playing Shadow Rovers. You have a problem playing Juventus. As long as that still exists, as long as there's still a dream that anybody can be, make it to the top, that any team can make an inning, until you stop, if you, we're not American sport, we don't close ourselves, ring ourselves up, and allow nobody else in. We do it every season, it's called promotion and relegation. You don't have to like it. Yes, there is survival. It is, there is still money to be made, but only because if people, if they don't, if people don't survive, fans don't show up. Yes, the boards make mistakes, they make horrific mistakes. Yes, the players make mistakes, they make horrific mistakes. And yes, the managers make even worse mistakes. But so do fans. But ultimately, it doesn't matter. The game hasn't sold its soul. That little kid at Black at Wigan, that little kid the Blackpool fan, if he doesn't make you believe the game hasn't sold its soul, then I'm afraid you're far too cynical for me.